again, just reinforcing the idea that this was not a first choice under any circumstances, invasion of Britain. That's not what the Fuhrer wanted. Uh, clearly, it had some tremendous dissension among the high command. And if you think back, this is the same Adolf Hitler that was apprehensive about finishing the job in the lowlands. This was the same Britain that had to evacuate 330,000 men from Dunkirk. Yeah, I like to that's correct. But Dunkirk took place uh, just before the those 40,000 soldiers escaped to Britain without a fight. Just let them go. A great question about last week's mature about the evacuation of Dunkirk. And why did Adolf Hitler allow that? Why did 340,000 soldiers escape, you know, were allowed to escape back to the British Isles to fight again? But without their weapons, not even a single shell, without their weapons, I have to say that. Exactly correct. They were not, and there's several reasons for that. Again, first of all, the fear was very reluctant to engage in this area because of the terrain. The terrain was not suitable for tanks. Second of all, as we said a couple of times here, peace with Britain was always desired. Always desired. And we'll talk a little bit in about 15 minutes how that peace would slip away through bombing of London. So again, I think the Fuhrer was always looking at a few steps forward, but cautiously pulling back, because Russia was always the bigger plan. I don't believe he ever had the intention of successfully defeating Britain. Now certainly the Operation Sea Line, they wanted to win by all means, but there were some logistical challenges, and we'll run through that in just a few minutes here. So we look at the Fuhrer Directive 16, which was the Again, preparations for a landing operation. And Germany would extend all of their bases up through the lowland company, countries, through the Netherlands, and northern France, where it's a very inviting target, only 25 miles away. But as we know through history, that channel has saved the Brits for the better part of a thousand years. And the Royal Navy was certainly very, very formidable. One of the big problems that the Germans had is they could not come up with enough transport ships to move personnel across that. So it's 25 miles away, it's very tempting, but there's still logistical challenges. We look at the German advantages and disadvantages as the war with Britain is moving. First and foremost is combat experience. Germany has effectively been at war for the last two and a half, three years. Their veterans have tremendous combat experience, and we just cannot understate the significance of that. But their disadvantages for a clearly overshadows. They lack any type of a coordinated plan. So much of the German war machine was a ground-based attack. They really were, as we talked last week, they looked at their panzer divisions as their offensive divisions. And the Luftwaffe was much more of a support. Send the Air Force in as uh, early support to soften up. But they were much more a land-based military. Their lack of aircraft. Again, they could not replace their aircraft. They did not have the German war machine up to full capacity. And that's one of the things that the author brings out real well in our book, is that the plan for German full military capacity was to be set by 1944. So in a sense, by starting this adventure early, Adolf Hitler was going against his own military planners. They were not at full military industrial capacity. Overconfidence, that victory disease. They had won so successfully in Poland, in the Netherlands, against their old nemesis France, when you win, you get tremendous combat experience, but again, this overconfidence would lead them to effectively, well, we can imagine all the challenges that overconfidence gives us, and they underestimated the Brits. The Brits had some very many advantages. First and foremost, you cannot under, underscore the significance when you're defending your home soil. 
And Winston Churchill puts it so eloquently that we'll hear in a few minutes just how significant that is. Royal Air Force pilots had the ability to bail out over their territory. They could bail out, parachute to safety, and in many respects, you know, get right back into the war. As where German pilots having to bail out over foreign territory was always a problem. Fighting over the British Channel and over the British Isles gave them fuel conservation. So many of these attack planes only had a 125 mile range. That's a very short range, and thus when you're fighting at home, you're able to stay up longer, and the Germans would have to break off pursuit and go home sooner. The air bases. Britain had the permanent air bases. Germany, of course, had extended their air bases up to the Netherlands, but they were not permanent bases. We looked at this integrated warning system. It really was the early radar of the day. And what's interesting about the radar is so much of radar at this time, being in its infant stages, you're sending out pulses and coming back. The Germans looked at the radar very much as an offensive weapon. And it was the Brits that, in many respects, pioneered radar as a defensive weapon. Of course, radar would evolve tremendously over the next four years. But at this point, uh, the Germans really just had an offensive radar that was just not effective for them. So the Brits had some tremendous advantages. Disadvantages, again, they lacked their trained pilots. They did not have enough trained pilots. And as we learned from fine American movies, Ben Affleck and many others went right on over and helped him out. But we did send over American pilots. Britain lacked a strategic defense plan. They had not planned for a German invasion of the island. Therefore, they did not have a strategic defense plan. And again, with the pilots, a lack of air combat experience. So Brits had their challenges, they really did. So one of the things you want to do, particularly students, is compare these. Compare the advantages and the disadvantages and they turn out to be wonderful midterm exam questions. The most famous British uh, fight plane at this time, the British Spitfire. And just a few basic characteristics of the plane. It had a short range, high performance. It was an inceptor. This was an aircraft that went out and sought your enemies. One of the problems, they had a carburetor. And thus a carburetor is not allowing you to fly upside down like fuel injection does. They would remedy that, but at this time, the biggest challenge with this is that it was short range. It would achieve 250 miles an hour. Now, something we'll talk about in a few weeks, this was still very slow by comparison with the Japanese Zero. The Japanese Zero would be upwards of 250 miles an hour. But sort of getting ahead of ourselves.